Glenn, we can't hear you. Have I been muted the whole time? Yes. <laughs> Nobody uh, wanted to spoil it. What a, what a stupid question. <laughs> so let's start over. Uh, with apologies, of course, uh, I'll call this meeting to order at 9.05 a.m. Uh, I would uh, confirm that the all members are present and I would confirm quorum. Uh, there are no members absent. Uh, I would uh, confirm that the CAO, the clerk, and members of the senior management team and staff are present and public input on this agenda was invited to TML public comment at muskokalakes.ca. We did receive correspondence uh, which was circulated to uh, committee uh, from the Muskoka Lakes Association and Fairhaven Island Association, re item 5A, report from the director of public works, re uh, increasing off street parking facilities. Um, today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka website and YouTube channel by participating in the open public meeting today. You are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. Um, we do not have a supplementary agenda for today. I would ask now any uh, committee members of uh, disclosures of pecuniary interest. Um, seeing not, oh, Peter. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find my button, but I can't okay. hear. Peter, uh, I'm going, Go ahead. I'm, sorry, thank you. Uh, I'm going to recuse myself on uh, delegation uh, 4A1 from the Chamber of Commerce. I have a, uh, clearly have a conflict. I'm on the board of the chamber. And so with the permission of the clerk, what I propose is simply to go dark so that I have no, uh, visual uh and nobody can see any reaction from me um and i'll stay on mute i don't believe there's a vote but i don't want to do anything that might influence uh the committee okay just a question on that clerk if i might uh as as uh, councillor kelly sits on that committee as a representative of the township uh does he have to recuse himself or is that just a procedural piece up to him uh, staff can't advise on conflicts of interest. Okay, good, thank you. We'll accept that, sir. Thank you very much for that. Um, I would note uh, motions have been pre-populated with random movers and seconders to expedite this meeting. Uh, members are asked to show physically raise their hand until the chair has confirmed the vote. If the vote is unclear, a verbal vote shall be recorded by the clerk. This is not considered a recorded vote. Uh, just pre-starting, uh, speaking of clerks, we have two in the room today, and I'm going to turn this over to uh, our CAO, Mr. Hammond, to introduce our new clerk. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I believe that Mayor Harding may have made an introduction while we were uh, sort of in between uh, um, in, in between sessions there. I, um, but in any event, I'd, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, introducing to committee uh, members of council our, our new director of legislative services, Tosh Kirk, Lauren Tarasuk. I believe you've all seen the backgrounder on Lauren. She comes to us from a, a legal and administrative background, so we're quite happy to uh, have her join the team. Thank you. Good, thank you. Welcome. Okay, we're going to start with our first delegations. Uh, item 4A, delegations commencing at 9 a.m. Uh, with respect to 2021 achievements uh, and 2022 budget requests. So with that, I'll call on Spencer Moreland, the president of Muskoka Lakes Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Spencer, sir, welcome. You have the floor. There we go, now I'm good. I had a bit of a mute problem too. Uh, thank you, Chair and Council. 
I'm Spencer Moreland, president of the Muskoka Lakes Chamber at 3181 Highway 169 Bala. I'm here today to give you your yearly report as part of our agreement and work plan we have with the township. I will need a little bit more than five minutes as it's impossible to report on all metrics in such a short time. Can that request be granted? Yes, absolutely. I'll give you some latitude and then, of course, please proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Uh, I'll quickly go over what's in the work plan. It includes four priority areas, visitor information services, tourism marketing, business training and support, and event development and promotion. Working with Township, we've agreed on performance measures for each of these areas, and that's what I'll focus on. Priority one is visitor info services. We've counted 921 people who came directly into our office to date. That's not including people who sit in their cars using Wi-Fi, contact us by 24-7 web chat, or pick up uh, info from outside racks. Not surprisingly, July and August were busy, and the numbers have not differed greatly from years past despite obvious restrictions. Top reason for visiting, general questions, information pickup, Wi-Fi, general services, and on the business side, several non-member businesses came in for rapid tests. Number of locations with brochure, uh, brochure racks, we distributed to over 250 locations multiple times, distributed through Wide Eye alone is 210 locations across Greater Muskoka. Usually that's 250, but some places like Gravenhurst Opera House remained closed. Still, we have our own places we deliver to like the township kiosks and to members. For general objectives met, such as keeping a year-round visitor center open, we were locked down in January but we're uh, the earliest to reopen out of all the chambers, which, which some chambers still remain closed. We exceeded our commitment to hire tourism ambassadors for Muskoka Lakes. We've had four students at different times from, sorry about that. Uh, we had four students at uh, different times from spring through December. We got extra grants to create those jobs. We actively pursue and display marketing materials and events for Muskoka Lakes attractions and businesses, both print and digital. As for information services at events, we attended virtual and in-person events and dropped into the Bala and Port Carling Farmers Markets. That's one thing we should clarify from last year. We don't have a phys have physical booths at these markets. The chamber started the markets and promote them, but we would only have actual physical presence if uh, we have received the funding for that. It's in priority two, tourism and marketing, where we are really shining. Even when people couldn't travel to our area during lockdown, we kept Muskoka Lakes at top of mind as a destination you want to visit when things got better. For hyper-local tourism, we can embrace the chill. Uh, we ran Embrace the Chill and Backyard Beauty Photo Challenges in the winter. Spring is here, reopening campaigns, daily business-specific campaigns, such as takeout restaurant videos and more. We're now out of uh, the 2021 Muskoka Lakes guides. They flew off the shelves. We distributed them through a lot of different areas. For metrics, we were asked to track whether merchandising targets are met. I talked about that earlier. We also tracked numbers of campaigns run, earned media and marketing partnerships fulfilled, included the distribution of the Muskoka Visitor Guide. We were asked to explore digital location-based marketing tactics, provide a total number of weekly e-blasts and measure social media activity and where possible capture marketing and campaign engagement results. We achieved all targets requested by you and more. On distribution again, we distributed far past our target, including shipments directly to Americans keen to plan their trips when the border reopened. We kept filling township kiosks with both our directories and township trail maps. Wide Eye reported tripling their regular drops in some high traffic locations. We also took on larger allotments of the Muskoka visitor guides that were supposed to be distributed by other Muskoka chambers, but they couldn't do it. So we helped, especially as a lot of the ad content is connected to Muskoka Lakes. For dig digital tourism and business marketing activities, we went far and above expectations. We produced daily posts. As of September 30th, we had posted 986 single image or carousel image posts, Instagram reels and videos. To give you an idea what that would cost if an ad agency were to do that, just a, a single post, not including our videos, et cetera, it would have cost $35 a post. That's just in the first three quarters. We're doing twice daily posts now to keep people informed of changing fall hours and have a big paid campaign coming up. We don't track posts we share, just the ones that we create ourselves. We'd love to be able to track the awareness generated by every single post. We looked at monitoring agencies, but they're really expensive in, in excess of 25,000 a year to, to track that. We had one tweet alone on June 5th about the Rock Golf Club that reached 320,000 people. What's the value of all this promotion? In the past, we've shared the local spend data Explorer's Edge has provided. It ranges between $141 and $165 per head. Marketing efforts and people we refer directly, our economic impact on the Muskoka Lakes is direct and significant. 
We share Township Explorer's Edge. You might know uh, about Cottage Country Spirit and Muskoka Tourism and engaged Muskoka campaigns about Muskoka Lakes as well. The only thing on our list we did not do was paid tourism promotion contest. That was supposed to start in January, but since we couldn't tell people to come here, we dropped that one. Instead, we ran other campaigns reminding people of how we look forward to seeing them when they could travel here again and urge people to uh, people living here to get outside. Our shop local videos also showed people how and where to uh, order takeout at any time of the year, uh, among other services. We're now developing a new Founded in Muskoka campaign to run through December. We're doing the media buy, advertising with every media outlet in South Muskoka, and this will help us far exceed our paid campaign expectations we set for you in 2021. The marketing and uh, production portion of our successful grant application is $80,000. Another metric is to maintain our position as the leading chamber on social media. We have the largest following of Muskoka chambers and we are nipping at the heels of the big Ontario chambers. We've had hundreds of thousands of social media impressions uh, this, this year alone. And it's not just during high season that we're gaining attention for township. One day in February, we had an unpaid post that reached 7,500 people in one day. One of our Instagram reels takeout uh, day is every day at Bent River Cafe had over 3,700 views when it first went live in May. The number of e-blasts is another work plan measure. As of September 20th, we've sent out 92 e-blasts to keep everyone informed. And that's over a 10 month period. So we're looking at about nine, over nine a month. Also on our work plan, exploring location-based marketing tactics. We had meetings with Driftscape, Crowdrift and Meltwater and now Muskoka Tourism is uh, talking to them more. To help promote Shop Muskoka Lakes, we ran a location-based device ID campaign. An example would be someone who cottaged at Lake Joe in August 2020 would see our ads come up on their cell phones uh, this summer when they visited sites like People Magazine. Again, we exceeded all performance measures, including in-earned media, which is news coverage and generated about Muskoka Lakes and the chamber that are not paid for. We have Muskoka Lakes in the news more than 30 times to date. Also, under tourism marketing is shop Muskoka Lakes. As expected, we spent 16 grand of the township operating grant to build and onboard vendors onto the site. We were able to get other partnership funding to put into marketing. You may have seen the magazine and TV ads and our ongoing daily mix of organic and paid social media. Vendors have praised the way we've marketed their products. Priority three is business training and support. That has included things like workforce attraction, business workshops, advocacy with uh, upper tier tourism organizations and helping businesses move to digital and e-commerce solutions. The metrics we were to report on included delivering a minimum of four education workshops in collaboration with Township. We did not reach that target as the workshops we expected to do had would have had to be in person in community centers, which were closed. But we did provide many webinars and especially COVID related virtual training events. We could have offered one, about one a week uh, through Ontario and Canadian chambers but some didn't seem overly relevant to Muskoka Lakes. Another metric, number of jobs posted to our career center. To the end of September, there were 103 jobs posted and with changes in wider Ontario employment partnerships, we had to work to make sure those jobs displayed on all job portals. We also produced separate social media posts on every job. Job fair participation is another metric you asked about. We ran an ongoing job fair through social media exposure and we also guided many groups such as the Y, Georgian Bay, uh, the district landscape, uh, the district rather, and landscape Ontario, and others on how to run virtual job fairs as we produced one of the first in 2020. Another metric is the number of housing rentals posted. We had very few of those willing to rent, did not want to do it publicly. Publicly, although it's beyond our mandate, we've tried to match people similar to what we did to get the township's public public works director into an apartment when he first came to Muskoka Lakes, and he's still in that apartment. A general tactic of the work plan is to help businesses go digital, which we did in several ways. While we don't have a report on the numbers, we can point to some. For example, it looks like 20 businesses in Muskoka Lakes were successful in getting the PMCN tech development grants. PMCN got three times as many applicants as they could fund. Some more funding will be available soon, so we may be able to get businesses to reapply or help new applicants get selected. Not on our work plan, but good to know for uh, our business support side of things. We helped 10 businesses get their support, uh, Ontario support grants filed reopened after they were first deemed ineligible and all of those businesses got funding in the end. 
The Landscape Ontario Grove program is also supported by us. It's an important opportunity for our landscape and gardening companies to have a pilot education program right here in Muskoka. Uh, if it doesn't get enough students, the province won't fund it in Muskoka again. I personally think this is very important. Obviously, as I'm sure many of you know, that is a, a budding industry it's, it's in the landscaping. So to be able to increase that significantly in Muskoka would be great. Our last area to report on event development and promotion, we operated eight in-person events with more coming, including the new Oktoberfest Muskoka, which includes the grand opening of the Port Carling Legion and the multi-anniversary celebration in Bala ribbon cuttings. And we organized a virtual International Women's Day event hosted by our executive director, Nora. Oktoberfest starts on October 20th. We've engaged two businesses in Muskoka Lakes to be title sponsors at 5K each and to cover more than half of the matching dollars for Celebrate Ontario event grant. As for the total number of events supported, we counted 40 up until the end of September, including almost weekly virtual business and tourism webinars and upcoming events. Those include a new virtual story time with Santa, along with a virtual Santa parade and santavisits.ca, which proved very popular last year and paid for by a private donor. And thanks to that private Santa, we're going to feed families in need in Muskoka Lakes through the Feed All Four School Board Fund. Other tasks we were expected to do as per our agreement and we fulfilled was to keep an events calendar. We supported every event we knew about that happened in Muskoka Lakes. We continue to promote the Muskoka Cranberry route. And of course we support the Ballot Cranberry Festival, which hasn't been easy this year given the obvious restrictions, but we're sharing this information online and answering phones and emails about it uh, constantly. So that's a brief overview and I can give you all the tasks and reporting metrics from our work plan agreement. There's so much more to tell you. I wanna thank you for your notes of congratulations on the chamber winning a COVID award out of all the Ontario chambers, right alongside the cha uh, Cambridge chamber, the second largest in Ontario. We're also proud to tell you that we have given out over 22,000 rapid tests to 102 businesses to keep our community safe. Finally, as uh, you're now in the budget process, the chamber is seeking the amount we asked for last year, $60,000. Our tourism market efforts alone deliver that much value. We also submitted a draft work plan with the budget ask on September 1st. I'm sure you can understand that like you, we're still working on our plans and overall budget for 2022. The chamber would be happy to share with you uh, and answer any questions about next year's plan uh, at your next committee meeting in November. Thank you very much. Spencer, thank you so much, sir. And, and that answers the question, what have you done for us lately? Uh, well done. Uh, I, must, I must say, uh, what a wonderful year, given all the uh, trials and tribulations. Uh, our thanks to yourself and certainly to Nora Fountain. Please pass those on to her. And um, I know that we will be having many discussions, numerous discussions over the uh, budget period. I see the mayor has a question, which I'll allow, and we'll quickly move on. Go ahead, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Zavitz. Uh, Spencer, thank you for um, your work at the Chamber and also uh, to Nora and uh, all the staff at the Chamber. Certainly uh, unprecedented times and continue to find ways to reinvent ourselves. I have two questions. The uh, Shop Muskoka uh, portal that was uh, funded and done. Uh, do you have uh, any metrics on how many of those people who signed up for that that were Muskoka Lakes Chamber members and how many were not Muskoka Lakes Chamber members? Uh, or were 100% of them chamber members uh, who participated in that portal? And then the second question I want to talk about is the what we can do to help. Our, our Santa's parade and uh, Christmas parades are virtual this year. I think we need to involve the township a little bit more personally. Uh, when sporting venues like, uh, I was going to call it Sky Dome Rogers Centre, or whatever it's called these days, my apologies, um, can have full capacity. Um, all of those Scotia Arena can have full capacity, shoulder to shoulder for a two hour event. And we can't stand in front of our driveways or in front of a store while people pass by, I think is inappropriate. And I think it is an opportunity for us when Cranberry Festival can co operate in capacity. Um, I think that the chamber needs to reach out for our council to help and have some greater discussions with our medical officer of health, assuming that it is our medical officer of health, Dr. Gardner, that's causing issues in this particular fashion. So maybe you wanna comment on where we're at with that and also the uh, shop local campaign. 
So for uh, Shop Muskoka Lakes, I don't have the metrics as far as how many were members for that. I apologize. As it relates to the Santa Claus Parade, I tend to think that that's on a, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, with, I tend to think that's probably on a, on a district level at that stage where we're going to be able to open up the guidelines, uh, op open up some of the restrictions as far as why we can't do it in person. Um, I'd like to say, I, I'm not really sure what the answer is as far as being able to, to assist with that, but certainly um, I, I know that the digital platforms we did last year were very popular. So although it's, you know, not the ideal situation, it's certainly, uh, certainly something that, that worked out quite well. But yeah, I, I can't say I really have a, an answer for you as far as what, what you can do. I mean, outside of, you know, lobbying with district as to when we're going to be able to open things up a little bit more, especially to those who have been uh, fully vaccinated. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't think I have a great answer for you on that one. Okay, thank you. If I may, Chairs, I was then yeah. just uh, a note, and I'm sure that uh, Nora is watching this as well, and she and I are trying to connect or have been for the past week or so, but um, uh, you have my full support to help uh, where we can, because uh, if nothing else, it would be nice to get people outdoors uh, and enjoying a parade uh, to wish in the uh, Christmas season. So um, hopefully that can happen and we don't have to sit looking at Zoom screens anymore. I completely agree. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Sp Spencer, with that, we'll uh, thank you for your report and look forward to uh, a further dialogue with the Chamber in the in the weeks and months to come, sir. Um, I'm going to um, thank you for that. I'm going to call on uh, Courtney Proven, uh, Director and Curator of the Muskoka Lakes Museum, for that presentation. Courtney? Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. You have the floor. There you go. That's how that works. <laughs> You're gone. There you go. Can you see your presentation? You can see my beautiful presentation. We can. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd just like to thank you all for inviting me to speak today um, about the museum's activities. So I'll just start by giving you a little information about your museum on the second page. Um, it was founded fully by volunteers in 1964 with some community support. We are an independent, not-for-profit community museum and public trust that is also a registered charity. We tell the story of the development of the Muskoka area, um, of all the origins and the history of the settlement of Muskoka Lakes and the whole township and even beyond that. Um, we maintain a collection of almost 4,000 objects that were fully donated by the community to be held in perpetuity for education, inspiration, and the enjoyment of the public. Our not-for-profit corporation owns and maintains the 5,300 square foot facility that the museum is housed in. And we attract and inform visitors through our various programs, our personal contacts, uh, special events, social media, as well as marketing. The 2021 was an interesting year for us. We had a 45% reduction in operating hours this year. So we were only able to operate for 60 days in 2021 due to the COVID restrictions. We were able to open in stage three and that wasn't until July 21st. Whereas last year we were able to open on July 1st. Um, Despite the shortened season, we saw an increase of visitors to the museum this year and had uh, nearly a thousand people visit the museum this year. On our last day of operations last Sunday, we had over 50 people come to the museum. We have a membership base of 275 members and they donate over $20,000 to the operating budget as of September 30th. We have several dedicated senior volunteers that help us transcribe some of the postcards that we had on exhibit this year, um, as well as helping out at the front desk, welcoming visitors and providing tourism information to visitors, as well as passive COVID screening. Um, we have a lot of people that come in and are here coming to see the museum and also asking about where they should go to eat, what they else they should do. So we also see ourselves as kind of a tourism center in Port Carling. For public activities, we held them all outside in the garden this year in order to maintain COVID um, restriction standards. And we had spinning wheel demonstrations in Thursdays in the garden. We had Wednesday night after hours talks with our speakers in the gardens. 
as well as Scales Nature Park came to visit and brought some turtles and reptiles for the kids to be entertained by and a few other things. So these programs were provided to the public free of charge. These were not, um, we did not charge admission for these. If people came and just wanted to see them, they could just go and see them in the garden. Um, but we wanted to encourage visitors and reward the people that were able to come out this year. We also rearranged a new lobby exhibit this year. We had put a display on um, the natural life of Muskoka, including information on geology, ecology, and wildlife in the area. We found that because we had reduced the gift shop previously due to COVID, um, we wanted to make sure that we had a space for people and we use that space appropriately so that we could actually see things um, and add to the educational impact. And then when people entered the museum, they saw that the, there was a full museum here. It wasn't just some old wooden boats, even though those are great. <laughs> our digital capacity, we have 2,500 followers over multiple, oh yeah, our online exhibits. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. We are doing new online exhibits on our website. So we are showcasing some of our objects that are not seen on display. We have over 4,000 objects currently in the museum and probably only a third of that is actually on display. So this year um, on a monthly rotation, the online exhibits will be changing up. Um, live right now is the first objects of the medical bag of Dr. Fennel Archdeacon, who was the doctor in Port Carling from 1960 until his death in 78. His medical bag and some of his medical equipment was kindly donated by his wife and children. Um, so we have explored um, a way of showing those while the museum is closed for the winter to try and increase our reach. Going from that, our digital followers, we have about 2,500 followers across multiple platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We had to rebuild our Instagram this year um, just due to a weird glitch in the system. So we were trying to rebuild that up from scratch, but we had multiple, um, a lot of success with our Fun Fact Friday that has been a really good hit with our social media campaign. And we're going to continue that throughout the winter with Friday um, facts and based on the online exhibit. So there will be objects featured Fridays that are not on the online exhibit on the website necessarily. We had 1200 new website visitors this year and our focus going forward is going to be helping to grow our digital following and increase our digital presence with the museum. We also created the community plaque project with help from the funding of the township. This was a great project to again, extend the reach and the history beyond the museum. It was inspired by various other projects seen throughout other communities. Um, and it was spearheaded by longstanding board member and volunteer for the museum, Susan Daglish. So she has gone and done some research with the help of the museum's information um, to identify some town, some homes in Port Carling and their original build date and who their original owner was, as well as what the original owner's occupation. And we are going to put those plaques up throughout Port Carling. Most of them should be up now. Um, Susan will be checking. And we're going to be expand beyond Port Carling next year. We already have people reaching out to us from Bala as well as Windermere. Um, and those are the next areas that we're going to focus on to expand this project throughout the entire township of Muskoka Lakes. We were lucky to receive an Ontario Trillium Fund Resiliency Study Grant that gave us money in order to conduct um, some work with TCI management consultants who are world renowned consultants and exhibit designers to help the museum plan for going forward with the new changes that COVID has brought um, the obviously increased need for digital presence and the way that we can do that, um, as well as improving visitor flow and improving the exhibits and that that we offer to the public. So that was completed in 2021. And going forward, we're going to base a lot of our upcoming enhancements and upgrades from that study. So where your funding helps us is some of our major operating costs, and these are costs that we incur whether the museum is open or not. Um, we have to pay $10,000 annually in insurance, and that keeps the 
public collection safe. Um, as we're a registered charity, we have a large accounting cost. We have to do charity reports every year um, and we make sure that we are following all of the rules and we are making sure that everybody who gives us money with the intent of helping the museum, that's what their money is going to do. We also have other hydro building maintenance um, and exhibit expenses for just upgrading the exhibits and increasing how we display them. So we have a lot of costs outside of just staff wages. We look for other grants through federal and provincial grants as well as our own fundraising efforts to help with our staff wages. We want your funds to go to all of these um, building maintenance and all of our other areas that we need. So I'd wanna thank you again for allowing me to speak. Our museum hasn't asked for an increase to our $35,000 that we asked for about 10 years and we try and use that very wisely. And we're also always looking for other ways to bring income in such as the provincial grants, as well as increasing our own fundraising efforts. Our fundraising hasn't been able to run for the last two years, our major fundraising gala artifact or fiction. So this is really important that we keep getting help from everybody. And we love that you're supporting us. And we're hoping that we're giving um, everybody something to look forward to when they either visit or when they're out here and just walking around within the township. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you. And we love you supporting us. Thank you. It's a, a good relationship, a symbiotic one. I mean, what a great history. Uh, we need to uh, show that to the people and uh, you do a wonderful job in your group. Thank you so much for um, maintaining um, that, that imagery and, uh, and, and the whole concept um, in the center of, uh, of this township. So thank you so much for that, Courtney. I appreciate your presentation. And again, we will be uh, discussing this at budget upcoming and uh, we'll take it from there. So thank you so much. Have a great day. I'm gonna thank call you. on, thank you. I'm gonna call on Pat Williams of the Milford Bay Community Library. Uh, Pat. Chair, I see. Oh. Okay. You there, Pat? Just a minor technical glitch. We'll be on it in a second. Pat, can you? I don't see her like at all. Do we want to go to Pat Young and come back? Is Pat Pat here? Do we want to do that? Sure. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's listen to another Pat. Uh, Pat Young, Walkers Point Community Library. Let's have Pat come on first, uh, Pat Young at least, and then we'll, Pat Williams, we'll uh, do everything we can to get you uh, into the chat room and, uh, and await your presentation. So, uh, Pat Young, I would give you the floor regarding the Walkers Point Community Library. Go ahead. Welcome. Yes, can you hear, can you hear me? Absolutely, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Go it's always a pleasure for me to share information about the Walkers Point Library, and I'm very pleased to be with you this morning to do just that. Uh, let me begin by saying that on July 1st this year, we reached a milestone, the 10th anniversary of the opening of the Walkers Point Library as a volunteer-operated and donation-funded library. 
We are now into our 11th year of operation and we continue to be a valued and sought after community resource. And I would offer the following three barometers to support that statement. The first is membership. In each of our 10 years of operation, we have seen continuous growth in library memberships. Yes, we even signed up three new members in the very short time we were able to open in 2020. And since we opened for the first time this year on July 28th, we have added seven new members. People are still hearing about and discovering our library and joining. In fact, some realtors are even mentioning our library as one of the selling features of properties here at Walker's Point. Uh, our second barometer would be donations. We continue to receive the support of the community uh, through their financial support. Many are annual donors and frequently their donation will arrive with a written note expressing their appreciation for our services and uh, for the volunteers who greet them with a smile, of course, behind the mask right now. Um, I should also add that volunteers working in the library often hear these types of positive comments firsthand when people are visiting. The third barometer would be our volunteers. We're staffed solely by a dedicated group of volunteers who very generously and consistently give their time and expertise in providing the quality of services that are so heartily embraced by our community. I think it speaks to the quality of our operation that when needed, we have successfully added and oriented new volunteers to our team and most often from our membership base. Uh, what are some of the contributing factors to this ongoing success? Well, first, I think we have to talk about the collection. We maintain an up-to-date selection of over 3,500 books, about 300 DVDs, as well as other resource materials. You can even take out a butterfly kit if you like. Maybe not right now. But. Members frequently compliment us on the quality of our collection, and we also encourage them to give us feedback on what they would like to see in a particular book or author. Uh, communication is very important in all aspects of life and business, and our members receive from us a library newsletter several times a year. Our email address is regularly used by our members to request or renew a book or to ask for information. And our website includes up-to-date library information, new programs and initiatives, upcoming events, new books that we've added to our collection and a link to our search catalog for a particular, and they can look for an, an author or a, a title. Programs and events. Um, our plans for 2022 are definitely underway. In July, we will celebrate the anniversary of the library with a summer celebration. We hold that in partnership with community organizations such as the Walkers Point Volunteer Firefighters. The community is invited um, for celebration cake, a barbecue, fire hall tour and demonstrations, and perhaps meet an author or two or see some antique cars. The summer children's program, which normally operates over four Thursdays in the summertime, is designed and delivered by a qualified educator with support from other volunteers. Walker's Point has also just passed a milestone with the first settlers arriving some 150 years ago and the children's uh, program theme will focus on pioneers and pioneer life. Planning is underway, connections have been made with the Muskoka Lakes Museum and the Muskoka Discovery Centre for their assistance in the development and delivery of the program. As a tradition, the final Thursday of the program will feature a, a special guest, so stay tuned for that. In December, at the annual Walker's Point Kids Christmas Potluck Supper, the library will continue its tradition of inviting all children in attendance into the library uh, between dinner and the arrival of Santa, where they sit down to hear a Christmas story. The hall board has gifts for all children in attendance up to age 10, and the library purchases gift cards for youth in attendance ages 11 through 16. Our winter work plan is underway. It comes as no surprise that our busiest time of the year occurs primarily between June and Thanksgiving, after which many of our seasonal members head home or south of the border until next year. The subsequent slower months traditionally provide us the opportunity 
to implement our annual winter work plan. Typically, this includes culling, reorganizing shelves, updating databases, and so on. This year's plan also includes a reorganization of our children and youth section to better reflect the access needs of our uh, shorter members. We also take this time to review our volunteer handbook and procedures, library forms, et cetera, and implement any required changes. Our newest library service is, uh, well, since September 22nd, people must be double vaccinated to enter the building for any reason. That means children up to age 12 are not allowed in and they're not able to choose from our great selection of books and DVDs. In an effort to work around this, our librarians will put together book or DVD bags, either their pick or ours, um, for the two week rotation. And we can arrange for pickup at the library or in some cases we can make delivery right to the home. In closing, the support of the township through its commitment to match fundraise dollars has been integral uh, to the success story of our library. And for that, we are most thankful. It is very important to our donors to see their donation go twice as far in their support of the library. We're hopeful that the township will continue to see that they are getting great value for this investment. Thank you. I got muted. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation and I certainly appreciate all of your hard work and your, your group uh, over at Walker's Point. Thank you so much. And we'll take that under advisement, of course, for our budget deliberations upcoming. So thank you very much for that. Have a great day. I'm gonna see if we can get Pat, or, uh, Pat Williams back on the line here, Milford for the Milford Bay Community Library presentation. Pat, are you there? Chair Zavitz. Oh, Pat, go, yes, go ahead. Yes, Councillor Roberts. Um, I've been in conversation with Pat. She's having technical difficulties. I phoned the, the office. They're trying to get her a phone number that she can call in on. So if we could just delay her presentation till they uh, solve the technical issues. I see Pat's trying again there. Um, she's just trying to get in, but I, I think it may be best if she just phone, I phone in by telephone. Yeah. Yeah, the, the link that she would be using, of course, to uh, seek access would also have the phone number that she could use. Um, I don't have it at my uh, at my hand here, readily to hand. Do I have it? No. Okay, um, I'm wondering if we have, uh, if I could move on, if we have Lori Cashmore um, on the Walker's Point Marina Road parking. I wonder if we could accept that delegation now if, she, if Lori is in the, um, the waiting room. Yeah. Do we have her? Okay, Lori, can you hear me? Yes, you can, I'm thinking. Lori, good morning. There you are. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Listen, go ahead, you have five minutes and uh, yeah. you're gonna speak on the Walker's Point Marina Road parking issue. Go ahead. Thank you, Glenn. I'd, I'd like to thank Director Becking for today's interesting report on increasing off-street parking. In particularly, the you got. Can you hear me? I seem uh, to have. You you go you go right ahead. We'll we'll just work through some of these. Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank Director Becking for today's interesting report on increasing off-street parking, particularly as it pertains to Walker's Point and Marina Road. And I'd also like to thank Councillor Zavitz for pushing to bring it forward. And I hope that all of you have had a chance to read it. The end game on Marina Road has finally been played. The winners, the family next door to Walker's Point Marina, who first complained and received the support of council to eliminate roadside parking on Marina Road. The losers, every island cottager in the area. You see, they just sold their property to Walker's Point Marina. The day they listed their property, their real estate agent sent me a personal email as a courtesy to suggest since parking resources in the area are now so limited, perhaps I knew some people who might be willing to buy their property for parking. 
Laurie, killing... I, sorry, Laurie, if I might, I, you're you're sort of you're getting a little personal there. I, I know you you need to talk about the personalities. I think you believe that. Uh, if there's a way for you to fashion this so that we can. Okay, sort of and that's it. all I had to say. That's what? all I had to say. No, 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 no. Uh, about that. Of, okay, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, please, please. Thank you, Councillors. The majority of Islanders aren't the deep-pocketed taxpayers you assume we are. For every wealthy islander, we, there must be 10 or 12 of us who bought island properties because we couldn't afford mainland property. Most of us struggle with the heavy burden of just maintaining our cottages and paying our high taxes. But now because of an ill-advised council decision, we've been forced to add $800 per year for each regular family member who wants to enjoy our cottage together, together with us. For many of us, that's a huge hit to suddenly absorb. You voted on a resolution last year, believing there was a safety issue on Marina Road, that there had been incidents regarding fire trucks and EMS. Clearly, that was not true. This report shows that without spending anything, Quiet Marina Road can handle street parking. And for $25,000 to improve the shoulders on one side, you can doubly ensure the safety on Marina Road. I ask you, now that the end game on Marina Road has been played, that you at least act on your own staff report. Stop thinking it's okay to simply dump the total extra cost burden burden of parking completely on the backs of Islanders. This council needs to take some responsibility for your actions and consider our rights as well. You made a decision that severely impacted our cottage lives this year without staff or stakeholder input, believing that there had been specific safety issues. You didn't care about then, about waiting for the transportation master plan or about every other parking problem you need to fix in this township when you singly attacked Walkers Point Islanders. We were targeted individually, not like every other parking area that you have to deal with, for what now appears to be no good compelling reason other than to pad the pocket of one local resident. The transportation master plan wasn't in your minds then, and it's still a long way down the road. You now have a fair and equitable response to a specific problem that you created. The report called increasing off-street parking also makes it clear you own no land in the Walkers Point area to do so. Please, for once, do the right thing and help us. Give us back some of the rights that you so abruptly took away for no good reason last year. Accept the interim staff alternative that will now safely allow us to park on one side of Marina Road. Thank you. Laurie, thank you very much. Uh, just given the, uh, our agenda today, I, I would ask you to, I, I suppose, hang around and listen in. Um, I will not go right now to our, our public works director for his report. We need to get through a few more delegates before we do that that um, on, on other topics. So just to try to keep to a timeline. If that's comfortable for you, please uh, stick around. Okay, thank you. Because I know, you know, when, when this topic comes up, when, uh, Director Becking presents his report. Uh, there will be some fulsome dialogue around this uh, around this table, and uh, you may want to witness that. So, thank you for your input and your uh, your time and your diligence on this issue. Uh, I'm going to go back now. Thank you. I'm going to go back to uh, to see if Pat Williams can we have we got Pat Williams available. Is is uh, are we going to be successful here? She doesn't have a microphone. Okay, Councilor Roberts has his hand up. I'm wondering, Gord, if there's any way that you could, well, help. So, uh, sorry, sorry. Yes, I'm trying to help. Um, she's um, not tech technically savvy on all the operations of the computer and we're trying to get her to call in. So if we, just with if, if the council, if the if committee would just bear for a while in the background, we'll try to get her hooked in. All right, if that's okay with her. Okay, okay. so we'll try to have a little bit of flexibility here with that. Um, I will move on. Um, hmm. 
So what, what I think we should do, uh, do we have Nicole White? Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have Nicole. So she, the, the auditor of BDO to attend at 945 regarding our 2020 audited financial statement, item 6A report. Who wouldn't want to hear that today? So there you go. Let, yeah, so Mark, I'm going to ask our uh, director of finance, uh, Mark Donaldson. Mark, would you like to introduce Nicole and um, perhaps a preamble on, on this? This is live, live TV. <laughs> go, go ahead. Great. Thanks, Mark. Thank, thank you, Chair Zavitz, and good morning, committee. So uh, as reported in item 6A of the agenda, so we are presenting the draft audited financial statements for the fiscal year ended December 31st, 2020. And uh, with us today is Nicole White. She's the partner at BDO who uh, conducted our audit and, uh, and is happy to report on uh, the results of the 2020 year in addition to what's been provided in the report. So I will pass it over to Nicole and okay. um, share, the, share the, uh, the appendix two from the, uh, um, from the agenda. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, is appendix two the actual oops, financial statement or it's the other report? It's your report. Okay, so let me just switch here. So what I've prepared, I think I've prepared this in the past for, for council. It, it's sort of an overview of the financial year and it, it's um, in a different format than sort of your financial statement line by line and lots of numbers. So if we could go down, yep, that page. So it's just a bit of a, um, a visual for some basic categories of your financial results. So we have the revenue, which is the blue line, and you can see generally trending upward, bit of a downplay in 2020. We all know the challenges of 2020, and it was not a normal year by any stretch. Um, the expenses is the red line. So you can see it's remained pretty consistent year over year. It's sort of, this is a five-year historical vision. Net financial assets, that has been increasing. And the net financial assets is an indicator of, you know, the financial health of the municipality. And the fact that this is a, a healthy positive number it indicates um, a good financial strength of the municipality. So the blue box is much smaller. It's your capital additions and it, it goes up and down depending on the needs in the municipality year over year. And then you'll see our annual surplus is kind of, you know, hovering. It's been increasing a bit the last couple of years. And the big orange line is your accumulated surplus. So it's also been um, increasing over the last five years anyways. So, and that's also just kind of supportive of the improved financial position of the municipality. So if you could jump to the next page. So I've just done, rather than I said, the rows and lines by lines, just sort of some pie charts to show you where your revenues are coming from. It's not really any surprises here. The majority is from our, our property taxes followed by grants. And then I think user fees. User fees is the blue, so 15% and 17%. And that's just the percent of the total. So it goes up and down a little bit as the percent of the total. The big green one, property taxes, and then the red and blue are your federal and provincial grants. And, and you can see they, they fluctuate a little bit year to year and as to what they contribute to the total revenues the municipality has. So if we wanna just pop to the next page, this is also just a five-year summary by your reporting um, categories. And it's just to show you sort of the trend for a five-year period. So it's a little more information than just the two column financial statement. So you'll see general and government has just kind of been increasing every year, year over year. Uh, 2020, I think probably a lot of the increase was related to COVID and we had uh, everybody's had additional expenditures relating to COVID and being compliant and all of that. The protection to services has gone from 2.9 and it's been gradually increasing to up to 3.1 over the last five years. And then you'll see transportation is kind of going up and down. Um, and included in these figures, you remember, is everything. So it's payroll and amortization and all the costs associated with that category. So it just sort of gives you a sort of an overall five-year trend by the categories that we report on. 
Um, so if we could go to the next page, this is sort of the final one. And this is just, again, uh, similar pie charts, but I've broken your expenses down sort of by these other um, categories. So salaries and wages continue to be the largest component of where the expenses are, followed by goods and services. And then I believe amortization is the next biggest one, which as we know is a non cash expense, but it's recognizing the use of our tangible capital assets as we use up the lives of those assets. So that was the year end report. And I'll, I'll just make a couple comments on our audit report. Um, we are issuing again, a clean opinion this year, which is what you want. Yeah, so it means, you know, these statements are in accordance with public sector accounting standards. And as a result of the evidence we gathered and the work we did, they present fairly the position of the municipality, the results of its operations, the change in net assets and its cash flows for the year. And we're looking at December 31st, 2020. There's a paragraph that just points out ultimate responsibility for the financial statements rests with management and those charged with governance, which is council, uh, is to oversee the processes related. So we are issuing a clean audit opinion, which is obviously a good thing. That's what you want at the end of your audit that we didn't have to qualify the report. So if we wanna go, I'll just touch on a couple numbers on the statement of financial positions. I think it's, yeah, this page. So overall, you'll see our financial assets have gone up about, I think it's about 3 million. I apologize for the watermark. It's kind of blocking out the number, but it's 28 million in 2020 versus 25 last year. And there is a spike in taxes receivable. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. I think that's probably related to some COVID initiatives, potentially. Did we allow taxpayers longer to pay? <laughs> There, there was a deferral period in the year, so yeah. that may have contributed to a part of that in high yeah. in the both in the year. Yeah, and then the liabilities, you'll see a total of 11 million compared to 11 million. So our, our, our position in, in what we owed as far as financial liabilities was fairly consistent year over year. So we have a bit of an increase in our financial assets. So if we just skip down to the next page, I think this is just the operation. So this is all of our revenues. So we were down a bit in revenues this year, 19 million compared to 20. And you'll see that our user fees is down. And we all know we had to close some of our facilities during COVID or not be fully open, which is, um, we can see the, the impact that's had. Overall, our expenses, 16 million last year compared to just under 16 million this year. So we ended up with a surplus of 3.4. We budgeted 2.6 and last year was four. So, you know, overall sort of a good result. Um, I'm not sure if everyone has had a chance to drill through the whole financial statements, but that is sort of the high level summary of the financial results. So if anyone has any questions, audit or otherwise, I can address those now. Okay, committee, I see uh, Councilor Jaglowitz has a question. You go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you uh, to the auditor, I wonder if you could just uh, refer you to page 16 of the, uh, the draft financial statements. Yep. And, and that's, that's dealing with the reserve funds. And you've, you've categorized uh, the reserves into two areas, and, but they both have the same heading. Reserves set aside for specific purposes by council, and then the same uh, down below. And what I'm referring to in particular is that one up above, which is called capital. Um, and you'll notice that's increasing. When you go down, uh, uh, roads are is decreasing. Just I wonder, could you just explain what, why the distinction? Um, these are your categories and the reserves between reserve funds and just reserves. Um, we've always had the two sort of reserves, which is working funds and capital and the others are just a, a, a number of specific purposes council has set up. I'm not sure there's any real distinction between funds, reserve funds versus reserves, but these are the categories that the municipality has set up and provided to us and the changes are done 
by your staff and decisions that are made throughout the year. So I don't really determine these categories. We okay. go through the continuity and we do a bit of audit work, but as far as the changes between categories, these are provided to us by your finance. I wonder department. if I might give, thank you for that. And I might give Mark uh, the floor for a moment. Mark, is this part of your, uh, I know as you took over and, and as you're, you're doing some cleanup, if you will, is this part of your maintenance piece that you were looking at over a period of time, changing categories, uh, streamlining, et cetera, or not to put words in your mouth, what could you explain um, in better detail what this might represent? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the and thank you, Councillor, for the for the question. So, generally speaking, within the municipal uh, area or or uh, sector, reserves tend to reflect operating uh, reserve funds. So, this would be working capital funds, and also the capital. I think is the capital levy that was established previous. I think a few years ago, uh, and these have been classified. They're they're more of a a draw where there's overs or unders that aren't, spe aren't specific. Reserve funds are more specific for capital purposes, capital maintenance. So the reserve funds, you'll see the arenas, the cemeteries, um, fire. And, these, and this uh, distribution, this setup um, did exist prior in 2019 and, and years prior. Uh, certainly will be something in terms of presentation that we will look at going forward for future financial statements to ensure that they align with our new uh, bylaw with respect to the reserves in that split we had identified between operating type reserves and capital type reserves. Gonna, I'm going to let, thank you for that. I'm going to let uh, Councilor Jaglowitz have a supplementary. Frank, go ahead. Uh, yes, I don't want to belabor it, but I, I now understand that the capital is something that hasn't been allocated to the in individual funds, which I believe we had a commitment to do so uh, over a period of time. So I, I gather you're going to be working on that. Is that uh, because you can see that what concerned me was that the roads reserve fund uh, was dramatically dropped. And um, uh, we don't get uh, uh, reporting isn't that great on what happens in the reserve funds. You see, all we're seeing here is it started at 2 million and it's now at 1.1. So, so we can deal with this later. But I just wanted uh, the auditor to... I, because this isn't, I don't think, the way you've presented them. But uh, uh, one last question, and maybe either of you could answer. Uh, Yadda, you did indicate reserves and reserve funds. So are all these monies set aside in separate bank accounts or just the ones that are called reserve funds are in separate bank accounts and the two at the top are just muddled in our uh, a general account? Is that correct? So thank so chair I can I think I'll take this one so <clears throat> I can tell you that they are not in separate bank accounts we have one bank account for the township um, when we did the the new bylaw for the reserve and the new policy for the reserve that did provide authority for staff to create a separate bank account in an effort to try to optimize returns on these funds that has not yet taken place but uh, for 2020 all of our cash resides in our operating bank account and is kept separate only on our uh, financial statements. So then possibly the use of the term reserve funds is, is maybe not, not appropriate. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Mayor Harding, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just a, a point of clarification or question, I think, uh, to Director Donaldson on the roads budget. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz commented that we've gone from a 2 million uh, capital in 2019 to 2020 at uh, 1.1. I'm assuming we just did a $900,000 project of which we reserve, removed some funds for that uh, in this particular year. And hence the reason we're seeing the fluctuation and the idea of the reserve is to actually stabilize and normalize the tax rate. Is that a correct assumption? Mark? Th thank you and share through you. So that, that would be correct. So any roads projects we would have done, we would have drawn from the roads reserve. Um, if there is any requirement for a special project or something that was not in the budget or anything that uh, was unanticipated in the year, we would draw from uh, other working capital reserves or capital reserves uh, with council's authority to, to uh, ensure that those were properly uh, funded and, and able to be uh, handled within the year without creating great volatility in the tax rate. Okay, good. Thumbs up. Um, I see no other hands. So given that, I will uh, will accept this report. Thank you, Suzanne, for your uh, 
or sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you, Nicole, for your, your work. I have a motion to read here. Uh, moved by Councillor Mazan, seconded by Councillor Nishikawa, be it resolved the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the Consolidated 2020 Audited Financial Statement, AFS, for the Township of Muskoka Lakes be received. All those in favor? Yeah, can we get the screen? Sorry, can we get the screen? Uh, here we go. Sorry, all those in favor? Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Okay, good, thank you very much. Okay, so now that we've, uh, I, I don't suppose we have um, uh, Pat Williams, are we gonna, she's gone. Okay, so we'll just, uh, we'll just have to see if we can come back to that at some point in time. So I'm wondering, um, cause I would suspect that with Suzanne uh, Craig, our integrity commissioner at, she's to be here at 10, that uh, that would take a that should take us a little bit of time. I'm wondering if we could uh, call on Mr. Ackerman if he's here to to um, um, to hear uh, Mr. Ackerman, and then we can uh, look at the uh, the uh, the report from Chriselle as we move through, just so we don't keep don't so we don't hold people up. Is he there? Yeah, they're both there. They're both there. They're both there. Okay, so being unsure what to do, uh, I think we'll call on um, Mr. Ackerman, if I could. I think I'll call on Mr. Ackerman. Uh, welcome you into uh, the meeting, sir. And, um, and then as we work through the agenda, when we get to item 6D, um, Chriselle will talk to us in terms of that staff report. So with that, I'd like to hear your delegation, sir. Um, you have the floor. There Thank you are. You. Welcome. <clears throat> Thank you kindly. Uh, this is to the General and Finance Committee, uh, matters of consideration. Um, I wish to express my gratitude to the members of the General and Finance Committee for their patience in this matter that we've, uh, in my opinion now, all resolved and remedied. Initially, I thought that this was a matter truly of a minor nature to be dealt with in a kindly neighborly way. With time, I have realized that human nature has had a significant impact on the process. At every turn, human nature has affected my path to reconciliation and caused me unnecessary obstacles to success in the process. I have renewed respect for those who serve the public and offer my congratulations to those who wish to do good. I have realized that serving the public is difficult and taxing in so many ways. I've come to realize that navigating safe passage is most challenging when people have their own agendas without considering community. Respectfully, Hi Ackerman. Uh, I have remedied uh, the course uh, of the uh, minor variances, and I'll be circulating uh, pictures of that uh, right after my presentation in this regard. I also offer a commentary that given my experience that I've experienced, it appears to me that council would be well served to somehow insulate all these, um, <clears throat> how should we say, complaints and, and, and uh, commentaries that come from uh, neighbors against other neighbors, perhaps through a quasi ombudsman service to protect and work with uh, the various departments in the township, township of Muskoka Lakes, i.e. Uh, shielding Department of Works, Department of, um, of uh, Building and, and various building inspectors. And I, for one, would volunteer to uh, go on to such a committee where <clears throat> by neighbor, for neighbor in community can occur where reasonable minds and reasonable outcomes can be uh, negotiated and worked on. Thank you very kindly for listening and your patience in this regard. Well, thank you, sir. And I uh, appreciate your words. Um, we've got to know you over these, these, uh, these months. And I know on our site visit, uh, 
Councillor Kelly and myself uh, certainly was an eye opener and it, it did provide uh, a lot of additional insight and, um, you know, good for you, sir. Nice to know you. We will uh, review your file uh, item 6D um, in due course today. Thank you, sir. If you want to stick on YouTube and you can witness that. Thank you again for your time and I appreciate uh, you coming forward. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Okay, so uh, we're on item 4D of Suzanne Craig. Well. Uh, okay, listen, um, hmm. if she's here, if we could get uh, Suzanne Craig just to hold for a moment, if that would be, if she would be so kind, um, and we could get deal with that uh, earlier matter of um, the Milford Bay Community Library, Pat Williams. Apparently Pat is here. She's on the phone. Pat, welcome. Hello? Are you muted, Pat? How can she be muted? She's on the phone. Sorry? Uh, so, Pat, Pat, are you muted? Are you? We can't hear you. Can you hear us? I can't say, can you hear me now one more time in my life? Or, <laughs> that'll be it. <laughs> I'll turn into a Habs fan if I say that one more time. Okay, listen, I'm Sorry, Pat, we just, uh, we do have to move on. I'm, I'm so apologetic to uh, you for not being able to communicate with you today. So um, I guess we'll give that the old college try and um, ask that somehow we could get your report and on, in due course, and we would certainly review uh, as, uh, as we would. And of course at budget time, Yes, if you could, I'm presuming you have it in writing and you could uh, send that to uh, to the clerk and uh, we'll uh, deal with it there. So thank you for all that effort. Um, I, I'm going to now, I'm going to now call on and invite onto the, uh, into our meeting, Suzanne Craig, our integrity commissioner. Uh, she's going to present our annual um, integrity commissioner report item 6C. And I would welcome you You'll becoming an old friend, Suzanne. This is twice in two weeks. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of council. I was, uh, my Zoom was joining. So do I start now or are you introducing? You go right ahead. All right. Uh, so I, uh, I say again, good morning to, uh, to the chair, mayor, members of council, those on the line. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, submit my annual report to the township, which sets out the activities of this uh, reporting year. Uh, you have a report before you that I request that you receive and adopt uh, for information. Uh, I present this report in my uh, fulfillment of the role of integrity commissioner under part uh, 5.1 of the municipal act. Uh, in that uh, section of the Municipal Act, uh, the integrity commissioner appointed by the township is required to submit a periodic report for transparency reasons. So individuals uh, who are members of council, staff, and the public may understand uh, the activities of my office. As you can see from the report, there hasn't been too much of a change from the previous year. I did receive two formal complaints. I did not bring any complaints to council because they were resolved. I did receive three informal complaints uh, that were resolved, but I did take some time in the annual report to set out some of the issues of note uh, that came to my attention uh, in, in my role as integrity commissioner. As you know, I did submit a memorandum in July of this year, but that memorandum came on the heels of several issues as it related to uh, just the uh, understanding of the public or, or better the lack of understanding of what a disqualifying interest is. Uh, whether it is a large jurisdiction or a smaller jurisdiction, there will be members of council who have uh, an interest in a matter that may come before council. There may be members who are appointed to local boards or committees. They are appointed to local boards or committees because of their expertise in certain areas, 
And for that reason, the public may see that as a disqualifying factor for them to participate in the committee. In the memorandum of July and in this report before you, I've taken some time to outline that usually unless a member of a committee or council has a direct interest that is real and not hypothetical in a matter for which they have to uh, make a decision, if they do not have that, that type of interest, then ordinarily in the courts with other integrity commissioners, that member is free to discuss. What the courts say is if you have a closed mind, so if a member of council or local board has a closed mind and to a reasonable person observing the situation feels that this individual is so entrenched in their beliefs one way or another that they could not make an objective uh, decision, then under the code, they would be barred from participating. Under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, if a member of council or a member of a local board has a financial interest that must be real, it may not be one day, but it must be real and not hypothetical. And if they, their spouse or their parent or child uh, has this financial interest or their employer, then the member of council should uh, recuse, is the, use that, the, the word that many use, but refrain from participating and not vote. So I took some time in the annual report before you uh, to try to, uh, to explain uh, that this did come to my attention uh, in, in several inquiries and, and informal reports. Um, I also concluded the report with some, uh, some best practices for uh, the upcoming election year. Again, uh, oftentimes members of council find themselves in situations where they are both a sitting member of council and a candidate for an election, whether it be provincial, federal, or municipal. Uh, you do not lose your right to, uh, uh, to democratically uh, weigh in one way or another. You can be a member of a political party, uh, but in your role as a member of council, as I pointed out in some of the examples, you have to ensure that there is a separation between your political views and your decision making on council. I think the, the report is quite clear and uh, certainly I'll stop here if there are any questions that you have of me. I think it's important to note that there has been a uh, fulsome dialogue with uh, some of your, uh, your constituents. And I think the role of my office um, is to in fact point out what the obligations of elected officials are so that members of the public know uh, whether you're inside or outside of the rules to ensure that staff have some guidance as it relates to their development of policies as it intersects with the code of conduct. And in first instance, that all of you understand what your obligations are, because as I have pointed out in, in several occasions, this is not a gotcha piece of legislation in my view. You should be fully aware of how it relates to your day to day so that you can effectively carry out your, your elected duties without being tripped up uh, by the rules or the code. Uh, I am here as a resource to provide information to you, your staff, and the members of the public, and I submit this report for your receipt. I'll take any questions if you have them. We certainly receive your report and with great thanks. And, uh, and I'm sure that we've all, I know I certainly uh, had a good read of it and appreciated our session uh, recently. And, um, it's it's good it's a good it's good fodder it's a good reminder and certainly uh, you're right there and that's a good thing so thank you for that I'm going to uh, call on Councillor Jagwitz uh, who has a comment go ahead Frank actually thank you Chair I actually had a, a question for the Integrity Commissioner uh, Suzanne you indicated in uh, another meeting that we attended that you may be getting responsibility uh, for the code as you referred to it. Uh, I think what you said this morning appears to indicate that you already do have that. So, so I'd just like a clarification. Can the public or members of uh, council make uh, a representation to you about violations of the code at this time, or is that something in the future? Uh, through through the chair to, to Councillor Javits, I hope I understood the question. So are you saying that uh, there is not a, a blackout period right now because of the election? Is, is that your question or have I misunderstood? Uh, I may have been misunderstanding your role. I thought in the last session, this session we attended about a week ago, you indicated that there is a move afoot to allow you to do things under the code. Ah, ah. And you, you indicated, I believe this morning, that you already had that ability. And I just wanted to clarification. Okay. Uh, through the chair, if you if I might, Suzanne, if I might, for clarification, um, 
to deal with the comfort zone here. Um, that meeting was a closed session meeting. So, so, so you know, to your comfort zone, go ahead. Thank you. Through the chair to, to the counselor. Uh, with reference to my role, I am your appointed integrity commissioner. And currently uh, the rules in force under the Municipal Act give me duties that range from advice to members of council and local boards, receipt of code complaints from members of council staff and members of the public, uh, intersection of the code rules with policies and therefore working with staff, providing education sessions to uh, staff, members of council and the public. So as your appointed integrity commissioner, I have those duties. The province of Ontario recently, well, not so recently, but they are currently working on um, potential amendments to the Municipal Act where there may be changes to the duties and the powers of integrity commissioners. And as the province has pointed out in the request for comments from members of public, members of uh, council and staff, uh, in, in, in light of what has happened in the city of Brampton and the city of Ottawa, as it relates to harassment and the codes of conduct there, where those councils have asked the province uh, for greater powers for the integrity commissioner to recommend that a member of council be, be removed from office, uh, those have not yet come into force. We are awaiting uh, the updates from the province of Ontario to determine if in fact, those uh, enhanced duties will be given to the integrity commissioner. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, seeing no other questions, I will again accept your report. Thank you so much for your time and uh, we'll be seeing you again, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Place. Thank you, chair, mayor, members of council and the public. Take care. Thank you. Okay, so at 10 uh, 25, we're going to have a, a 10 minute uh, break if we could, maybe back here about uh, 10 35, um, and we'll get right into uh, the public works. Okay, thank you. Hmm?
It is right there. What are we going to change it to? Yeah. Any, anyone? Sure. Go ahead. Really okay. Welcome. Well, welcome back. I believe we're we're live. Derek just made the first pot of coffee in the room, and William Shatner is going to space today, and he's ninety years old. So things are happening all over. Things are popping, as they say. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. Um, I have a, a brief bit of business here, just very quickly. I'm going to moved by Councillor Kelly. Seconded by Councillor Bridgman, be it resolved the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the annual report from the Integrity Commissioner as presented on October 13th, 2021 be received. All those in favor? Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz is, is not there. Okay, good. thank you. Okay, we are going to move now to item 5A, a uh, report from our Director of Public Works, Ken Becking, relating to the increasing off-street parking facilities. It was requested at the August 11th uh, General Finance Committee meeting. Um, I will ask uh, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Hollis will uh, put your presentation up on the screen, Ken, if you would be so kind as to, uh, to go through that with us uh, and the public here and now. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and uh, good morning to members of the committee. Um, uh, the matter before you uh, is a issue that has arisen as a result of the public demand for increased bylaw enforcement. Um, of particular note was um, an issue for uh, parking in the vicinity of the Blomaris Wharf and the Walkers Point Marina, although um, the, the uh, effects are, have been felt throughout the township. Um, as committee will recall, uh, under the Highway Traffic Act, uh, vehicles are allowed to be parked on the road except where prohibited through the passage of a um, municipal parking bylaw. And uh, as you are aware, we all have, we have one of the uh, such bylaw in the township. Um, in terms of existing conditions uh, with respect to the Bomaris area, uh, the road is six meters wide and narrows uh, as it approaches the, uh, the Bomaris Wharf. Uh, the shoulders are a half meter uh, wide approximately with localized widenings to provide parking on uh, the south side. Uh, uncharacteristic of most of the roads in the township, uh, the road has a fairly hefty uh, traffic volume of something in the order of 800 vehicles a day uh, during the summer peak period. Uh, the parking is permitted currently on the south side of uh, the road. Uh, there is a two hour uh, limitation uh, for parking in the vicinity of the Anglican Church. Um, you'll recall last month I brought forward a report which indicated to you that um, these are long-standing parking um, conditions uh, that were unfortunately not incorporated into the most recent version of the township's parking bylaw. With respect to Marina Road, uh, again, the road is fairly typical of most hard surface roads in the, in the township. It is six meters in width with half meter shoulders on either side. Uh, the road uh, has a unposted speed limit of 50 kilometers an hour and uh, carries traffic volumes in the order of 100 vehicles a day. Uh, in 2020, uh, when council adopted the uh, current parking bylaw, included within it was a restriction uh, that prohibited parking on both sides of the road from Barlockan Road to a point 400 meters to the to the west. Uh, sorry, to the east. Um, in terms of long-term solutions. Um, Issues such as this are typically uh, addressed through policy documents and policy requirements that are included typically within your uh, official plan. 
and in a transportation master plan. Uh, with respect uh, to these policies, uh, they set tests for creation of, of um, individual access points and, and waterfront lot landings. They established tests and, and development standards for marina properties. Uh, they identify criteria for the location of publicly owned off-street parking facilities uh, and related policy type requirements. Uh, they determine when and where public parking on public roads is to be permitted and standards for the design and construction of roads. Um, as you're aware, the uh, official plan for the municipality is currently under review. Um, to date, Council has endorsed a policy direction in which further lot creation of water access only properties uh, would require a deeded uh, mainland access in order for them to proceed. And so as that process moves forward, uh, I'm sure council will, will address many of the land use planning issues uh, associated with, with these kinds of situations. With respect to the transportation master plan, council approved uh, a strategic plan for the municipality uh, in the past year. One of the goals of that plan was the development of a transportation master plan. Um, a TMP, as it's commonly referred to, is used to develop policies and uh, long-term directions that act to support the achievement of the objectives of the official plan for the municipality. Um, it's staff's view that if this had issue is to be addressed, it should be addressed uh, through uh, these two documents and in order to have consistent policies that apply throughout the municipality that ensures fairness and equity to all. And that is staff's recommendation with respect to a long-term solution to the, to the issues before you. With respect to the interim um, situation, uh, the bulk of the available off-street parking is located on private property. Um, and the, the lands that are currently used for that are, are zoned appropriately. Um, as far as Walker Point is concerned, we're aware that a uh, zoning bylaw amendment application has been received for the construction of a private parking facility in the vicinity of the uh, Marina Road uh, Marina, and uh, that will come forward to you in, in uh, due, co due course. Um, with respect to township-based initiatives, um, the township does not own any properties in the immediate vicinity of these two locations at the present time, so there's, uh, there's a limit to what we can do uh, in order to address it in the, in the interim. Uh, staff would point out, however, that um, on-street parking is not uh, a suitable means by which to address long-term parking issues. In terms of alternatives, uh, with respect to the Bomaris area, um, the uh, Milford Bay Community Centre is located approximately 1.8 kilometres away from the Mo Bomaris Wharf. Uh, under the current um, regulation, uh, parking is allowed up to 72 hours at that location, and it is available to be used. Council could choose to amend the, the parking bylaw to extend that period of time for a select number of parking uh, locations if you choose to do so. Uh, as it relates to uh, Marina Road, um, Council could amend the parking bylaw to uh, allow for parking on one side of the road. Um, it is suggested that of the two uh, sides, the south side is, um, is the preferable one in that it's not uh, developed and therefore um, would cost the, cause the least amount of interference with the, uh, the mainland cottagers. I would point out, however, that that uh, would leave a very, very narrow amount of roadway for two-way traffic. 
And in fact, it, in my view, it would be too narrow. Um, if you wish to go down that road, uh, then there would be, uh, it would be advisable to widen the road to the extent possible on the south side. Um, and I indicated to you how that might be accomplished. Uh, in the alternative, you could repeal the sections of bylaw 2020-053 uh, uh, and return the uh, parking situation to that which existed prior to its passage. With, uh, with respect to financial implications, uh, the report lays out uh, the options. It, any of the options would have a minimal financial impact save and except for the widening of Marina Road if you choose to go down that, uh, that path. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to try and answer your questions. Good, thank you. Uh, if we could get the full screen again, that'd be great. Um, so uh, committee, I guess I need to look at you all. Here we are on the screen. So, um, okay, before I, I call on uh, Councillor Councillor Hayes, I wanna say as, a, as chair, that you know, I I want to know if this committee has any real appetite to to look at this. I mean, I don't want to spend forty five minutes of our time today on a valuable schedule, and uh, at the end of the day, have it an eight two vote. So we're not even voting actually. So to, to my point is, is that we would you know, in some sort of fulsome manner, embrace this report. And uh, and go further with with this. So I, I, just as a preface to that, I will call on uh, Councillor Hayes, and I'd like to uh, make a statement. Thank you. Thank you. Through you, I have a couple of comments. I, I'd like to thank Mr. Becking for his very thorough report. Um, I am going to support staff in the fact that this is something that should be looked at as a town a township issue. And it should be done with the report that's coming up for transportation um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, Ms. Kashmir mentioned she disclosed that the marina has purchased the property abutting the marina. Um, we should probably know what their plans are for that before we make a decision on parking. Because if they're going to expand their docks and they're going to expand their parking, then there will be even more need for parking on the road. Um, the $25,000 does not say how much of the land would have to be paved um, in order for parking to take place. And one of the things that I, I don't know if many of you saw the, um, the video that was going around in front of Hardy Lake Park, which only allows parking on one side, um, there were parking on two sides just because there wasn't enough parking. Uh, so that's what happens and it becomes a matter of enforcement and we don't want to have to spend valuable resources to enforce parking issues. Um, there's also the issues of U-turns. You have all these people that are parking, you know, uh, two tenths of a kilometer away from a main artery and they're going to want to turn around and go back and go over that two tenths rather than go around the loop. So there's going to be as many cars as there are parked on the road, turning around and pulling you turns in the middle of the road, and this is not safe. Um, that's all, I would support this going to Mr. Becking for a full report on township wide. Uh, just, there is a difference between Bermores and Walker's Point. Bermores is a public landing. Walker's Point Marina is a business. So that would be what I would say for today. Thank you. Councilor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I, I, what I, I wanted to just talk about Walker's Point a little bit more. Well, it, it would apply to both. I don't understand. Um, I don't understand the number of parking um, unit, units that we would be trying to create on Marina Road. Um, so my concern is, and I, I will just use. Um, the Torrance uh, Whiting's Beach, as an example, I have been there when there's been 11 vehicles from one cottage. So one business taking up 11 parking stalls. Um, 
do we what do we do when all those parking facility units are taken up by a couple of cottagers and the, the other islanders are not able to access those parking units I, I, I is a township actually looking at um, somehow getting a, a permit uh, for instance like if a business wants to use that location um, would there be a permit process in place uh, and I would suggest that this conversation definitely has to go to the a bigger plan uh, but that's the challenge that's the challenge on 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 um, marina road for sure um, I would say that I was very very disappointed at the disparaging words that were used uh, to neighboring property owners and I hope that the chair would have a better handle on that going forward um, we should not be allowing people to to uh, negatively comment on, uh, on, on other individuals. And, and in fact, a lot of the information isn't necessarily factual. Uh, but I am very concerned that we don't have an understanding of how many parking uh, units that we're trying to establish and who gets to use them. Because there, there's, the problem is still gonna be there. Um, if, if, as I said, if one uh, property owner takes up the majority of the parking spots. Where's the fairness in that too? Um, and just as a little side note, I don't have any public, par I don't have parking facilities available to me either other than my private land. And so I think it's a, such a bigger discussion uh, that we can't have today. Thank you. Go ahead, Phil, sorry. Sorry, thank you very much uh, for that, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have a couple of questions, I guess, of Ken, uh, Director Becking. Um, on page number two of your report, you've got a diagram for Bomoris uh, Wharf and um, the north side of the road uh, has a bunch of red. Obviously that's no parking all down by the wharf itself. Uh, past Wilmot store is all red. There are some green sections that allow for parking. Um, is that is what is proposed but wasn't reflected in the bylaw? That's how it's signed today, number one. Um, I, I'm, or if we don't amend the bylaw, where is parking allowed on Bamoris Road? I'll, I'll start with that first question, if I may, to try and get some answers. Dr. Becky? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh... The mayor is correct. The, the diagram that's included in the report illustrates what is the current signage, not necessarily what is in the current bylaw. And, and uh, you will note in the recommendation section of the report that, counts, uh, that staff are recommending that the bylaw and the signage be br brought into congruence with one another. So if you approve the recommendation as presented next month, I would propose to bring forward a bylaw to amend bylaw 2053 uh, to give effect to that. If I may, Mr. Chair, then a supplemental. Go ahead. Um, the non or the current bylaw, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to go back in memory and some of my uh, fellow Councillors have been around the table when this bylaw was put in, but the or the proposal of signage allowed parking on both sides of the road, including the north side. Is that correct, uh, Mr. Chairman? No, that's not correct. the The current signage predates the current bylaw, and as I explained in my report to you last month, um, as a result of a, an area error those requirements were not carried forward into the new bylaw. The signage that is presently in place reflects what is shown in the diagram. And my recommendation to you is to bring the two, both the signage and the bylaw into congruence with one another, one way or the other. Um, um, I would recommend that you leave the signage in place and bring forward a bylaw to amend the bylaw, the parking bylaw, so that the two agree with one another and basically reinstate 
the previously existing condition. Okay, sorry, let me, if I may, uh, this latitude to understand, this is what the intent, this is what the signage is. The bylaw today, as it's written, however, permits parking on the north side. Is that correct? It's silent, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so and that it, answers my question. Um, and, and as such, it does have the effect of permitting it. A comment, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, at this right, point. Um, regarding Marina Road, obviously, I think I, I don't really want to make any changes at this particular point. Um, we're off season. Uh, we don't have the Islander need that we have. I think that uh, we can do a little bit more investigation um, and confirm some costs, what is going on with other properties around and whether or not the parking problem will be going away for next season. But I certainly want it to be a uh, ongoing report. I would suggest from um, uh, maybe an update in general finance if there's any changes over the course of the next several months. Regarding Bomoris, um, my question would be specifically to those uh, Ward B councillors in particular, and what would you like to see? Um, Again, it's a more of a in-season problem than an off-season problem. Uh, would you like the signage and the bylaw to be in tandem or want to put a pause on that right now as to uh, where we reflect or update going forward? And I, again, I'll turn to Ward B in particular with that. Okay, Councillor Roberts, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, I would like the... Um, the uh, signs to remain um, and I want the bylaw corrected to because of, of the reason that they were put in place many years ago by previous councils because of safety issues. I believe that the transportation plan needs to look at this fully. Um, within two kilometers of the current Beaumaris, we also have parking issues on Mills Road. So th this bringing a point up that We've got parking issues all over the place. We're just talking Bomaris right now. So I need to see it go back in place. And then before changing anything, if we were going to entertain that, I would like to hear from all constituents in the area, because I know there are a few that are just silent at this time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, I don't want to repeat what Councillor Roberts just uh, mentioned, but I think uh, I, I support the direction that Councillor Roberts just said. Is it, I think we need to have these two things back the way they were, but know that it needs a comprehensive look, which is why we've all talked about this transportation master plan, finding public, understanding the, the role we need to play and where and how. There's a lot of moving pieces happening um, on, on both sides of the uh, equation, private and public. So uh, I think we need to go back to where we were and, uh, and, and, uh, and give this a chance to, to be done properly and to hear from all the key stakeholders. Thank you. Good, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you. I, uh... I agree with my uh, fellow councillors on this. Uh, it is a problem. We should be looking at it. Uh, could I ask that, and that director backing, the 800 cars a day, is that right down to the wharf or is it like, where was the count taken? Mr. Chairman, it's, it was taken sort of mid block, Let's be that as it may. Um, and um, obviously the, some of the traffic will tail off uh, um over the length of the roadway but uh it's a it's a reasonable approximation it might be 100 cars one way or the other but not significant enough to change the decision no that that's fine but uh, it, it's it, not supplemental no i just wanted to know like how many cars go down to the actual wharf because you know this would uh you have the the yacht club there you have the golf course there a lot would be turning in and that before that and that, but if there's 800 cars or even 500 cars going by there, it's a, a uh, there, there should be no uh, parking there other than two hours for, for church on, on a Sunday. And that, but I, I, I would just like that clarified. But thank you very much for the information. Excellent report. Thank you. Okay, good. Anyone else? 
saying no other comments, I, I would suggest um, having read the report, I uh, was surprised to see the, the reference to its title, um, increasing off street parking facilities, very specifically, we're talking uh, Walker's Point and Bill Morris. Um, having been so acquainted with Curry Street in Bala and witnessed it through the year this, this summer, this season, and how its uh, positive effects were in fact that, I guess you'd call it off-road parking, where in fact the cars are parking on that shoulder. And then to see where the, our public works director was, uh, you know, provided such a great insight into a, a small amount of money really to provide quite a bit of parking. My bigger concern has always been, and it's been this way for months now, is, is and, and I think if we'd had this report, and I'm just going to maybe say this, spilt milk now, but there's no way this thing would ever pass any kind of a test. This would fail miserably uh, with this committee and this council. That, you know, we, we did something quickly. We, uh, I honestly suggest, uh, I know that we sometimes don't have staff reports, but in this case, to have a staff report like this 14 months later, um, and it validates and verifies what everyone is suggesting, I will not be supporting this motion today only in, and because um, I could not support um, us actually making a mistake and then verifying it and validating it here and now. So uh, specifically in, Bo in Bo Morris, as it relates to both locations, um, while the season is over, um, it's year to year to year. And I see no reason why, for some reason, this, uh, this committee could not, for a limited 12-month period, for example, next season, allow some sense of, of, of some type of parking for uh, some of these people until they can pivot, until they can make other arrangements. Um, and that is sort of my plea. I, I know that it's uh, falling on deaf ears. And uh, in fact, I have no motion here to read other than... Um, the recommendation by staff today. So, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say. I think we've, we've beaten this thing up and we've beaten it to death. We've heard from everyone um, to put it away to next year. And uh, that 18 month uh, master roads, roads plan. And um, I, I don't know, I just not sure we've served our, our constituents well here. So with that, I will defer to uh, my friend, uh, Councilor Kelly, and then read this motion. Uh, thank you, and through you, um, you know, I've got a couple of thoughts on here. It, it doesn't matter sort of how, well, I guess it does matter how we got into this situation, but the fact is uh, there are a few things that we have to recognize. Um, we got a report this morning, and I, I don't know how many of you have had a chance to, to look at it, and I'm taking some information from there that I don't know whether that's, you know, I have no way of validating it, but apparently this parking situation of Bomeris has been a hundred year sort of standing issue. And that's the claim that's, that's made, the assertion that's made, whether it's 100 or 10 or one minute. The fact of the matter is, these cars are not going to disappear just because we don't want them there. Um, some, somehow, they will have to be accommodated. To me, that means, and again, two choices, either public or, or private relief will provide some sort of parking off the street for these uh, good people. Um, I don't think we have any ability to provide that. Hopefully somebody who is a privateer will have the opportunity to, pro uh, to provide that, similar to what I understand to be going on at Walker's Point. In the meantime, these cars don't go away just because we don't want to see them there. They need to be accommodated. Similarly, to the extent that this has been a long-standing issue, I think notice needs to be given before we pull the rug out from under it. I think we need to give some reasonable time for people to find an alternative. I don't think the winter is the time, not only is long enough, but I also don't think it's the time to find an alternative. So my preference would be to somehow accommodate what has been, a, I understand, a long-standing situation in Bomaris and allow the people to continue to park. Uh, while we scramble to find a way to accommodate, that may include or may not include the overall transportation study, depending on how far out that is and how long that's going to take. But at the end of the day, saying we don't want these cars there doesn't solve anybody's problem. Uh, helping to find and accommodate uh, what is clearly a parking situation, and I applaud the fact that we're looking to uh, require new lot development and water access situations 
are going to have to have somewhere, uh, you know, on uh, road accessible parking. Uh, but that doesn't solve these problems that we're dealing with here today right now. The only thing that will solve this problem is some energy around finding a solution and some time to get the solution uh, developed and put in place. And uh, I, I think that to do anything else would, would, is just going to exacerbate the problem that I think we started 14 months ago. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Edwards. Uh, yes, uh, further to uh, Councillor Kelly, a hundred years ago, I don't think we had the volume of cars coming up, up, up here then. That's one thing. Secondly, when we have told people for, I know the 15 years that I've been on the uh, Committee of Adjustment up here, if you sever uh, uh, a, a property on the island, it says no public parking. And that, so we've created the problem by letting severances go through. I can look at, at, at islands that that uh, have five and six lots been severed off on them. We, we say you must have parking. I don't, uh, I, I would hate to see it have to be deeded parking, but there should be something, but they have been told when they, they severed and that if I had a cottage on, on uh, Marina Road there, on uh, Friday morning, I'd move all my cars off my, my property and park them there so that nobody else could uh, uh, block it up. And that's so why I, 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 like we do have a problem. We, we've got to get it fixed. I don't know what the answer is, but to say people have been parking there for a hundred years, I think it's uh, is wrong. And that, um, and that, but um, uh, like I say, we created the, the, the problem by letting severances go through. And we're looking at that with the official plan. I don't know what the answer is, but you know, we have to look at it, but you, you look at the other people and that if, if they're if they're parking in in the front of their their uh, their uh, property they have some rights too so i don't know what the answer is but you know to say oh it's been 100 years but think of it back then and that a lot of people were coming up by train back then and now taking uh, the the uh, the steamers up 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 to their cottages and not so you know, okay. we have to be looking at today's problems, not not a hundred years ago. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and and to you, sir, um, with your vast experience in history, going back as you've uh, shared that with us here and now. Um, do you see any any rationale to any kind of a deferment of this recommendation, staff recommendation, or is it seemingly that one would read this uh, rec staff recommendation? What's your thought on that? Well, it, it, it's, it's been a problem. You said Curry Street, you said this and that. Like everywhere there's, there's a, 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 a public or a private landing, uh, there, there's going to be problems. So I don't know what the answer is. We, we came up that, that they could park up near the uh, community centers in uh, uh, Milford Bay. We're trying to bend over backwards. There is some private parking coming up. Um, I know where uh, I was keeping my uh, boat at, uh, at Parker's Marina, I uh, paid for slippage and I, I had parking there as well, even though I could have almost walked there, but I, it was easier to drive down. So uh, you look after those, those things. So I don't know what the answer is and that, but I, I, it's something that we have to look at, but um, maybe we've got some lands and I don't know because I've, I've heard, oh, well, it was too far to walk from, from Milford Bay parking lot if those families have private parking there, because there is private parking, they could go out and pick up their, their, their guests or family. They could drop the stuff off at the wharf, take it up and then bring it back. It's a little inconvenient, but it is part of a, a, a solution. I'd hate to see somebody get uh, hurt and that with, with cars parking. I was down to, um, to uh, Morris, and some of the cars are parked there. They're not right up the shoulder because you have to get out and get in almost into the ditch and then people just park partly on the road for, for convenience. So I don't know what the answer is. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes, the mayor and Councillor Robertson will wrap this up. Okay, just uh, through you, just so that we're clear, the people that have slips on Walker's Point that own the islands all have parking in the parking lot, uh, signed parking that they are allowed to park at. What we're talking about is visitors. And when somebody visits at Milford Bay Marina, 
they pay for day parking. When someone visits at other local marinas, they pay for day parking. Marinas may allow one or two spots for workers that are free. Um, that's up to the marina to supply that. I know that when um, I've spoken to other people that have gone to other marinas to visit people, they pay for day parking. And I know when I go down to Toronto to visit friends, I pay for parking. It's as simple as that. Um, and I don't think that our roads are an answer to long-term parking, especially when you're talking about a business and the only difference between parking on the road and parking off the road is uh, paying a, a day fee for being there. We have three areas within Ward A, Ward B, Ward C that allow for parking, free parking and free pickup. And those can be utilized by the, um, by the workers and also by visitors coming in. Yeah, okay. Mayor? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, the only change I see or a recommendation today is to bring Bomoris bylaw into the same lockstep to the council resolution from a number of years ago when we decided to amend that bylaw. We just didn't amend the bylaw. We're theoretically not making any change. We've been issuing tickets. People have been dealing with it. We've just figured out we can't enforce the tickets. I've heard quite clearly from all three Ward B councillors that they would like to amend this bylaw. I'm not getting in the way of that. The only other thing it talks about is Bemoris Road, or sorry, um, Walker's Point and Marina Road. And we're talking about that in an official plan review and transportation projects. That will be a discussion for another day. So I'm happy to vote in favor of this today. Councillor Robert. Thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, uh, in Ward, Ward B, uh, Councillor Mazin and, and Councillor Edwards and I have, we've had a lot of discussions on parking specifically in the area in Ward B. And I, 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 I um, supportive of the report that Director Becking has presented. I just want to ask uh, uh, Director Becking one question and then possibly um, to answer your question, uh, uh, Chair Zavitz, maybe I can propose a, a solution. Um, the, the question I'm asking uh, Dec Director Becking, uh, Dr. Becking, the transportation uh, plan, our master plan, um, I, and I don't want to go back to the report to remind myself, but we're looking at a completion sometime in 2023. Is that correct? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, the, the intention is to issue the RFP mid-year next year. Um, it could be done in six months, but I have my doubts. I would suggest to you that a, a probable completion date would be early in 2023. That is correct. Okay, thank you. So then my, my, my question or my solution, I think is that that's a long time to wait as Councillor Kelly was saying for um, the constituents that have the problem. And I think we should maybe at this time consider striking a committee of, of community to uh, of a small committee to come together um, for, the, for the Marina Road and for um, the Bomaris area to green light what possible solutions, at least get the ball rolling. Out of that discussion, perhaps, there, there could be, you know, a solution come out of the left field. Um, I can think of one that's really out there for the Bomaris area, but I'd have to uh, talk to a lot of different people and get a lot of buy-in before I would even talk about it. So I, I think a committee would help right now so that at least we're, we're, we don't put this on the burner for a year and a half. And that's my suggestion. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Mayor Harding. Thank you. Just a comment. And I appreciate uh, that we don't want to put it on a back burner for an hour, year and a half. We have a ton of projects that are sitting within this council and this term of council. Staff have identified this and we are working towards this. Uh, I, I, I would not be voting in favor of yet another committee to try and advance something outside of a transportation master plan uh, or as outlined by our director in this particular report. And I apologize, um, Councillor Roberts. Uh, truly trying to manage every one of our own personal time as well as outside committee time and everything. I believe our staff have this, have made recommendation 
um, and I am uh, fully supportive of following this recommendation. Uh, I did make a comment that we continue to bring maybe a quick update to parking on a regular basis to General and Finance Committee, and I think that may answer uh, Chair Zavitz's concerns about where this goes and that we do address the people. So hopefully that is enough to satisfy, but I don't believe personally that we need yet another committee to try and solve a problem outside of a master problem. Okay. Given that the mayor has spoken, uh, anyone else? I see no hands. Okay. Well, um, moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be it resolved uh, that the General Finance Committee recommend a Township Council that the Township's official plan review and transportation projects be completed and endorsed by Council as soon as is practically possible and that the township's parking bylaw be amended to bring it into alignment with the signage that is currently in place on Bull Morris Road. All those in favor? Okay. All those opposed? Okay, that's carried. Councillor uh, Edwards has a question. Sir. No, it was from the last one, and I didn't see my hand up there. Thank okay, you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item 5B, uh, Director Becking, you're, you're on the dance floor again. Uh, report from you on the Bala Arena Alternative Uses Winter 2021-22 was requested at the September 15th GNF uh, committee meeting. Sir, your report. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as requested, uh, staff have uh, reviewed uh, possible alternative uses if, uh, for the arena if the ice is not to be put in in the coming winter season. Um, and um, if it's uh, committee's wish that uh, we pursue this, uh, we would be happy to do so. Uh, I'll take any questions. Good, thank you. Okay, committee? Um, Councilor Anishikawa, you want to? Thank you. <clears throat> Couldn't get my hand up. Um, mostly, I, I'm hoping that we're leaving the door open that if, for instance, a group uh, comes forward that is going to offer a, a, an, an additional uh, recreation opportunity, that we would leave our our options open and our doors open. Um, you know, things are changing very quickly in this province. It, you know, certainly we've seen that with the Leafs and things like that, allowing 100% capacity. Um, some of the rules that, you know, it was already spoken about by the mayor, the rules are not making sense when it comes to um, what happens in the township Muskoka Lakes. So I hope that it's not restricted as to some of the suggestions that were put here, uh, but that we do allow for other groups to come forward for recreational opportunities in Ward A. Thank you. Good, thank you. Any other, uh, Councillor Hayes, go ahead. Um, thank you and through you, I did hear from half a dozen people um, in the Bell area, their first choice would be to ha have the uh, ice back in. Uh, the reason being is they do a lot of uh, winter uh, events with hockey tournaments and that really helps the local economy in the winter. Uh, that being said, uh, when I said that probably wasn't going to happen because of the uh, what we had already previously received from Mr. Becking, um, they felt that a, a walking option would be an alternative that they could uh, live with until the ice was back in, but as soon as possible, that's what they're asking for. Good, thank you. Councillor Nishikawa again. Thank you. I just have one question, just because I've been hanging around the arena quite a bit um, in preparation for um, well, both the, the, the Legion and, and Cranberry Festival. Um, I, I noted that there was a lot of work being done at the arena. Um, and I think I sort of looked it up in the budget. I think it was in the round the range of $100,000 or something in that range. Um, I, I am curious though, how does that warranty for that work, if we're not actually putting the ice in, how does the warranty work um, on, on some of those items if we're not actually um, utilizing it as a ice service? 
Director Becky, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the work that uh, is currently underway is the uh, exchange of or replacement of the chiller unit. Uh, you'll recall that you approved the award of that tender uh, some months ago now. Um, the warranty is based on, <laughs> excuse me, is based on the completion of the work. Um, uh, the units will be put into service, albeit not to the full extent of their capacity uh, because we don't need them for the ice, but they will be operated and cycled um, as I've indicated in, in my report. Uh, so they will be utilized. Okay, Councillor Roberts, go ahead, sir. And thank you, and through you, Chair. Um, I, I apologize, uh, Director Becking, if I missed this in your report. But what is the specific reason for not opening up the um, the uh, arena for ice usage, Mr. Chairman? Um, committee will recall that when you considered the reopening plan for the township's infrastructure. Staff had canvassed the usual um, user groups of that facility and found that there was little or no need uh, for ice time that could not already be accommodated at, uh, at the other arena. So there was no economic justification for reopening it at this time. Uh, sub supplemental, um, Chair. Go ahead. I find that... We should look at the, the, the statistics. I know during the summer, my family spent at least 10 on 10 events in the Bracebridge arena. They were extremely busy. I know that uh, there are people in the community are driving to Humphrey to get ice for their, for figure skating and for hockey and for pleasure. So I, I, I just can't understand, I guess, the, the there's got to be the, the need for it and and again just it, is the cost that uh, significant that we can't have it like we have the community centers open to the community just as a place to gather and perform um ice functions as um councillor nishikawa was applying that there are people that really would like to use it so that that's my thoughts on that Ken, as I recall, and if I threw you, you know, that in fact, people would be using and sourcing the Port Carling uh, arena in, in ice in its in entirety, if you will. So that was the compelling reason why Dalla wasn't going to have ice again this year. And I think, again, with the ever-changing COVID uh, protocols and restrictions or, you know, easing of, uh, this could be a moving target. You know, we might be coming back here in a month saying, uh, Let's open it up. Let's get the ice in. Um, I'm not sure of the viability of that, Ken. Can you speak to that? I mean, are we can we pivot if we have to or if need be? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. And the short answer to your question is yes. Um, if council were to tell me today that you wanted ice in that arena, I could have it in there within uh, five days um, and ready to, to, to use. Um, the, uh, as I indicated, um, the COVID and the COVID protocols play heavily into this, into this matter. Um, we have the resources necessary to keep one, uh, arena open and we have enough demand to justify one arena open at this time. Um, if that situation were to change tomorrow, uh, then we would have to adjust our game plan. But based on what we know today, this is the uh, this is the recommended course of action. Okay, good. Thank you, sir, for that. Okay, uh, Councillor Edwards, and then we'll wrap that up. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, Chair Zavich. Uh, with the uh, the uh, COVID uh, relief. Uh, and that fund, is there anything that we could tap into that? I'll tell you why. A lot of arenas that are saying you have to basically come dressed, you've got 15 minutes and you go out on the ice and have to be off bringing. If we had two arenas open, we could uh, that uh, alleviate some of that, that, that traffic and even open up for, for public skating on, on, on some of these things that uh, 
that, that would help uh, for exercise and, and that. But if there's any funding that, that we could get uh, with that, um, I, I would maybe think that we should just uh, revisit that and that because it's, it's uh, a thing that to have it uh, closed. Thank you. Okay. To, and to Ken, I'm not, is, it's not so much a funding issue as a, a practicality issue, is it not? Ken? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. It's just, it's COVID. <laughs> COVID's here. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to read this uh, resolution. Uh, moved by Councillor Jaglowitz, uh, seconded by Councillor Kelly. Be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the Bala Arena be made available for alternative uses on a scheduled basis for the 2021-2022 winter season, as outlined in report number PW-2021-025, dated October 13th. Uh, 2021. All those in favor? Good. Thank you. Carrie. Here comes the emails. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, and thank you, uh, Director Becking, for your time today, for your reports. Uh, I'm going to now call on Mark Donaldson, item 6B as it relates to his report on authorization to release a, an RFP for audit services. Uh, Mark, you've got the floor, sir. Excuse me, thank you, Chair. And uh, this report is fairly straightforward. Um, it's been eight years since we've gone out to tender for RFP services. We did a 2013 uh, call uh, and awarded that contract to BDO. We did a three-year extension a few years ago with the completion of the 2020 audit that we saw earlier today. Um, our contractual obligations with BDO are complete, and this would be a, a process to go for competitive bidding services for auditors for the next uh, period of time, up to five years. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, committee, any comments? Any questions of Mark? Okay, with that, I'll read this resolution moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Hayes. Be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend a Township Council that staff be authorized to issue a request for proposal for audit services for a term of up to five years, commencing with the 2021 fiscal year. All those in favor? Good, that's carried. Thank you, committee. Okay, so that's that. Um, okay, well, thank you, Mark. I think that ends your... Uh, your role today. Thank you, for, sir, for your time. Uh, I'm going to call on Chriselle now as it relates to report um, uh, item 6D. Um, she's our land and agreements coordinator. It's license agreement application Longview Investments, roll number 9 14 07301. Chriselle, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Um, good morning, committee. Um, you will recall the license agreement application submitted by Longview Investments Limited for the encroachment of a sewer line, stairway, landing, stone walkway, and path that is situated on an original road allowance. The applicant has advised his intent of withdrawing the application. Um, however, as the application has been processed and considered, in order to conclude the matter, we are recommending that the previous motion be confirmed. Um, so with that said, I will turn it back to the chair. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, any comments, uh, committee? It's been here a while, we're gonna move this along. Moved by Councillor Edwards, seconded by Councillor Jaglowitz. Be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the June 16, 2021 General Finance Committee defeated resolution GFC-2-16-06-21 to deny the license agreement application for encroachments of a sewer line, stairway, landing, and stone walkway on an original road allowance lying between concession 13, lot 35, Monk, and concession G, lot 35, Medora, leading to Muskoka be confirmed. And further, that as per staff report LS-2021-20, the applicant be required to remove all encroachments and restore the original road allowance by the deadline of June 30, 2022. All those in favor? That's unanimous. It's carried. Thank you, committee. 
Okay, Chrishell, we also have a report from you on license agreement application Crowley uh, Saunders roll number 7-1-040-02. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, so the township has received an application for a license agreement for an existing encroaching driveway that is situated on a portion of township owned land. Uh, based on staff comments, it is recommended that tentative approval be given subject to the conditions as listed in the staff report. Um, so with that being said, I will turn it back to the chair. Good, thank you. Okay, there's a hand up, Councillor Hayes. Um, thank you, through you. I have a question. Um, the agreements refers to 2003-5 bylaw that restricts the right of public passage subject to um, leases and licenses. Does that mean by giving this person access to go across uh, part of our public land in a form of, of driveway, that area is now restricted from use from the public? Okay, good question, Chrishell. That is correct, um, as detailed in the bylaw you referred to. Supplementary, Councilor Hayes? Uh, yes, being that they are, are not paying any funds um, other than the fact that they are paying for the insurance because they are crossing over it, um, is there a way that we could still allow that portion of our public right of way to be used by the public? It, it's not like normally that when there's an encroachment, there is a, a structure something is on there that, that people can't get around and it belongs to the other person. This is just a driveway that goes through to the property. So I'm just wondering if there's any relief that we can get from 2003-05 uh, that will allow this area of the driveway to remain public. Let's ask uh, our clerk, Cheryl Mortimer, that. Good morning. If that is the desire of the committee, that we would have no issue with uh, respect to waiving that bylaw with respect to this specific um, license agreement. We could put a clause in that. Would that be our wish? A little thumbs, there's a thumbs up, a couple of thumbs. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Councilor Jagowitz, you have your hand up and your thumb up. Yeah, that's fine. I just wanted to uh, support that request. Good, thank you. Okay, uh, I wonder if we would take a couple of minutes then and uh, craft that into the resolution that we have in front of us. Uh, as much as I don't wanna slow this thing down, perhaps we would take about five minutes, maybe come back at... Okay, Cheryl's. Cheryl's going to write it out. And our new clerk is observing how she needs to be fast on her feet. <laughs> if we can be Cheryl, if we can make sure that we have Sarah Lehman in the queue, she'll be she'll be up as a six F right after. Yep, good stuff. Here she is. Right. Okay. Okay, good. So moved by seeing no other hands, moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazan. 
Be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council that the application for a license agreement to maintain an existing driveway situated on a portion of township owned land, roll 7 1 048, lying in lot 41, concession 7, Bala, Crowley Sant Saunders, sorry, roll 7 1 040 02, be approved in accordance with Township. Uh, Council Policy CLS-07, subject to the following conditions. That a draft survey be prepared and provided to the township for review prior to registration. That no annual fee be required as the license agreement is for a driveway. That once the above conditions have been fulfilled, a bylaw be passed at a future council meeting to authorize the mayor and clerk to execute any documents required for the license agreement. And further, that the conditions of bylaw 20... 03-05 be waived. All those in favor? Good, that's good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Two of those, that's great. Okay, thank you, Chriselle, for your time. Appreciate your reports. Uh, we're moving on to item 6F to report from our Sarah Lehman, Human Resources Manager relating to health and wellness uh, and staff supports. Sarah, your report, welcome. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chair. So this report provides an overview of staff health and wellness improvements corporate-wide a proposed revision to the health and safety policy statement and a proposed enhancement to the extended benefits program. Staff have been following the psychological health and safety in the workplace standard in order to have a clean, clear framework for implementing wellness initiatives. In general, the more areas of the standard we implement and promote, the more we invest in our safe workplace culture. A proposed change to the health and safety policy statement has been included in the appendix. And the purpose of this change is to show that safety encompasses all aspects of well being, physical and psychological. And a commitment from the senior levels of leadership is a best place to start. In an effort to improve the wellness program and respond to mental health challenges, which have been increased from the pandemic. A proposed change to broaden the definition of mental health provider in the benefits plan has been included. The current coverage is $300 per person per year for a psychologist. And we're recommending to uh, maintain the coverage amount and just change the um, provider to uh, psychologist, psychotherapist, psychoanalyst, and social worker. And we do not anticipate a significant increase in cost. Uh, regardless, this claim cost area will be monitored and trends reported back next year. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Good. Thank you, Sarah. Appreciate it. Okay. Committee, any questions of Sarah and her report? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, moved by Councilor Nishikawa, seconded by Councilor Roberts, be it resolved uh, that the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council that the re revised health and safety policy statement attached as appendix one to report number HR-2021-02. Sorry, that might be appendix I. Uh, be approved and that staff be authorized to direct the township's benefits insurer to broaden coverage within the existing psychologist benefit as described in report number HR-2021-02. All those in favor? Uh, Council Sorry. Council Chair, Council Chair, uh, okay, Councilor Nishikawa is not in the meeting. Councilor Nishikawa, are you there? She's not here, so we'll change that to. Not there. Okay, so that would be moved by Councilor Mazan, seconded by Councilor Roberts. All those in favor? Okay, good, thank you. That's carried. Okay, now we'll invite um, our deputy clerk, Cheryl Hollows, uh, regarding a 2020 AODA status report. Cheryl. Uh, thank you, Chair Zavitz, through you to, uh, to committee. Good morning. Uh, my report uh, is fairly um, explanatory. Uh, annually, we are re legislatively required to provide updates to council regarding the 2019 to 2020 
2023 multi-year accessibility plan. And this report details the improvements that have, uh, have been undertaken in the year 2020. Thank you. Any questions I'm happy to receive. Good, thank you. Uh, committee? Okay, I'll read this. Uh, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Zabit Spear. Can I do that? No. <laughs> Mayor Harding. The randomness of COVID. Moved by Councillor Hayes. Seconded by Mayor Harding, be it resolved that the General and Finance Committee recommend to Township Council that the 2020 Annual Accessibility Status Report as presented on October 13, 2021 be received. All those in favor? Good, thank you, committee. Sorry, Councilor Ishikawa is, sorry, Councilor Mazan. Okay, so that's eight. Okay. Oh. Councilor Mazan, sorry. I apologize. I just have been freezing, so I missed um, a good chunk of what you just talked about. So I'm not sure if you're waiting for me to vote. We, we but just I'm wait for voting. you to vote. Yeah. So are you unable to vote if that's the case? I don't know. I just I didn't hear what you were saying. So I don't know if it needs to be repeated or. Well, I'm happy to read the resolution again. Sorry. You, you, did you hear uh, Cheryl Hollow's report? or a reference to her report? I heard the tail end of it, but I've read the report. So okay, good, I- thank you. Okay, so I'll read this again. Thank you. I'll read, I'll read this again, absolutely. Council, uh, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Mayor Harding, be it resolved that the General Finance Committee recommended Township Council that the 2020 Annual Accessibility Status Report as presented on October 13th, 2021 be received. All those in favor? Good, thank you. Carrot. That's Carrot. Thank you very much. Okay, um, here we are, item 7A, committee. Uh, the minutes of the Parks and Trails Advisory Committee. I'll receive those onto the into the record. I don't. If there's any commentary, if you'd like, you're certainly welcome. If not, I would uh, move to uh, item 7B, which is the minutes of the uh, the Rec uh, Parks, Trails and Facilities Master Plan Steering Committee meeting minutes of September 9th. Is there any commentary you'd like to share with us on the status of that or we recently had meetings, more to come? Uh, seeing none, okay. So we'll again, take those uh, into the public uh, record. Thank you. Uh, economic development item eight, there was uh, no meeting this month. Item nine, unfinished business. Is there a committee, any unfinished business you'd like to uh, bring forward? Seeing none. Okay, item 10, new business, uh, direct uh, the district municipality of uh, Muskoka updates. Mayor Harding's on the bubble, so we might as well start with him. Mayor Harding, do you have anything to report to us this month? Yeah, just give you the quick highlights. Uh, we actually had two meetings, one of them being that of yesterday. Um, but uh, um, Santa's Village Road is sort of one big update that uh, it's been about several years in trying to figure out the solution, but we're still working on it. Um, there's a new draft silent, signed bylaw that's going to be coming in the coming uh, weeks or coming months, um, and that should address some of our issues. The biggest item of note However, happened yesterday at a meeting, you may have heard it on the news today, uh, our committee is recommending a new uh, solid waste curbside collection contract uh, to be handed to GFL uh, Corporation. Um, we uh, released our contractor about uh, two months ago, three months ago, and uh, served them notice. And uh, their contract will expire the end of 2022, October of 2022. They're going to provide service till then, at which point GFL will be picking up um, the new contract. There is an increase in organics that will be done. And uh, there's also our curbside uh, recycling uh, and all of our recycling contract is included in that solid waste contract as well. Um, so that's my report. We're 
changing our service providers. Good, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nishikawa, is she here? She's not here. Moving on, Councillor Jago, to go right ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Finance and Corporate Committee, uh, Corporate Service Committee met on September 20th. A few interesting things. Um, the committee considered whether or not to increase the uh, technology stipend for members of district council. There was a survey that the only one that's even talking about it, uh, the area municipalities is ours, all the rest are not. So it was decided not to do that. By the way, that stipend is $1,692 a year. Uh, the other interesting thing that we're, uh, the way the budget works at the district, um, approval, tentative approval is given to increase staff, and then it has to go through the budget process. So there were two people that were recommended to the committee to be hired. One is a full-time dedicated financial manager for asset management. That's an annual salary of about 132,000. And taking a, uh, another person in facilities management who was part-time and making them full-time. Once again, both overhead positions that have been added to them. It will, uh, of course, require budget approval. The last item is just interesting that uh, the uh, strategic corp recommended a district council that they enter into some shared uh, uh, programs with lower municipalities. One was started at sharing legal services with Huntsville and Georgian Bay. Uh, Georgian Bay decided to stay with their current legal, citing the reason that uh, having a, a multitude of lawyers for, for uh, specific areas was more efficient. And as a result, Hunts fell back out too. So that program is not going forward. That's my report. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, no questions or comments on that. Alan Edwards, uh, Councillor Edwards, please go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Stavitz. Um We had the, a, a public meeting on uh, uh, Moose Deer uh, uh, community drinking water intake. And that, and um, basically, they just have a, uh, a zone of about a hundred meters. Uh, sorry, a thousand meters, and and they're letting property owners know. There was a public meeting on Trail Ridge Homes, and uh, uh, let's see, we had a verbal update on uh, uh, child care and um, Muskoka Affordable Housing uh, Initiative uh, Program. Get the uh, amount here, and that uh, the funding allocation of five hundred and sixty thousand be uh, transferred, and that to uh, affordable housing, uh, Great Hurst against uh, property for uh, seven affordable units, and uh, that was passed. And uh, that was. The Oh, yeah, on that one. And uh, there wasn't too much. Okay, the, the, thank, the, thank you. The, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, in the absence of uh, Councilor Nishikawa, um, under uh, 10B community events update, um, I would ask committee, any thoughts, okay. observations, uh, announcements? There's one, Councilor Edwards, go ahead. Um, I would just like to say that uh, the Cherry Fox was a virtual run in Windermere this year, and they raised over $28,000. And to date, uh, they've, they've had them. They've raised over $476,000 in, in Windermere for uh, cancer research. So uh, the uh, community should be uh, commended for that. Thank you very much. Great news. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, uh, I guess uh, certainly the uh, Bala in terms of the Cranberry Festival, although Councillor Nishikawa is our anchor representative for that event, she is not here. I do know that it's uh, obviously Friday, Saturday, Sunday in good old Bala on uh, Maple Street. Uh, one needs a, a ticket, a registration. I believe they're 80 to 85 percent sold out, although I do not know what that number, those numbers represent in, in, uh, in people. Uh, anyway, so uh, check it out. Uh, anything else? Any other events or thing? Okay, good. Seeing none. Uh, I'll refer you all to items 11A 
through uh, H, which are items that we receive from other municipalities as a matter of the public record. Are there any items there you'd like to isolate or will we, okay, there you go. Uh, Councillor Edwards, go ahead. Thank you, not so much isolate. Um, I believe we sent uh, one on uh, the OOHIP eye care. It would be nice if we have sent something in to be noted when other letters come in because sometimes they're they're coming back and back uh, and that. So if we say we've already uh, addressed it, it would be helpful in the future. Thank you. Really, really good suggestion, of course. And, and we would, I believe that uh, there are not a few on council this afternoon. Two, yeah, there's two, two of these are on council this afternoon. I believe uh, item G, which is the lottery licensing to assist small organizations. And um, is it, the other one might be, is it E? Suicide? Anyway, they're on there. We'll see them in an uh, hour's time. And that's go supplemental. Ahead. Yes, uh, go ahead. Maybe uh, last month we sent something in on uh, the uh, property, the uh, capital gains and on the other. So it would be nice to, to, to reference back on, on the ones that we have. I, I know the ones are coming this afternoon, but right. after you go through a few thousand pages, you, you, you're not sure what's, what what has been uh, looked after? Thank you. you. Listen, sir, you're absolutely right, and it's been duly noted. And as as you've been great with this kind of pet project, we'll update and monitor and make sure that we uh, get better. Continuous improvement is that goal. Um, I'm going to then move on to. Uh, we have no closed session. I'm I'm going to uh, move to adjournment at twelve o'clock. By the way. Uh, moved by Councillor Bridgman, seconded by Councillor Edwards, be it resolved that this meeting adjourn at, uh, it looks to be 11.55 a.m. And the next regular meeting of the General Finance Committee will be held on Wednesday, November 10th, 2021 at 9 a.m. or at the call of the chair electronically from the Council Chambers Municipal Office in Port Carling, Ontario. Uh, the following special General Finance Committee meetings will be held as follows. I'm sure they're in your calendar now. Wednesday, November the 3rd, 2021 at 9 a.m. for presentation and deliberation of the 2022 draft township operating and capital budgets. Thursday, November the 4th, 2021 at 9 a.m. for presentation and deliberation of the 2022 draft township operating and capital budget. And then Thursday, December the 9th, 2021 at 9 a.m. for budget deliberation of the 2022 township operating and capital budget. All those in favor? Great, thank you, that's unanimous. We'll see you in an hour. Thank you very much, all.